Good morning and welcome to Houston Baptist Church online on Sunday the 25th of July. We hope you're doing well and keeping safe. So uh, last Sunday we were able to meet physically uh, in a chapel that's been loaned to us which was really helpful and today we're going to bring you some of that service that we experienced in the room uh, from last week here on video and we're going to mix that up with a few other things as well. But we're going to start with a song. Here is Amazing Grace. But it's great. This is the, the most of Helston Baptist Church in one place in 16 months. I'm going to read uh, from Psalm 122. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. There, thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Now, uh, by house of the Lord, that does not specifically mean this rather pleasant building that we're borrowing today and probably next week and maybe one or two more times. It means us. We are uh, the house of the Lord 
and uh, it's lovely that we can assemble together. I need to say hello to the folk who are going to watch this next Sunday. Hello on July the 25th. We're sorry you couldn't come this week. We hope you're able to come uh, next time. Um, but it's, uh, it's lovely that we're able to be gathered together as God's family. And now we're going to pray. So uh, if you would like to, please pray with me. Father, we thank you for this new day. We thank you for the things that we can see and experience around us during the summertime. Uh, we thank you for keeping us safe through the last few difficult months. We want to say to you as creator of heaven and earth today that we recognise your glory and your majesty and the things that we see around us at this time of year. Uh, we thank you that we're able to um, see something of you through the wonders of creation. But we want to thank you also for being who you are, that we would see through uh, this wonderful handiwork of yours to the majesty and wisdom, to the power, to the intelligence that lies behind it all as we look at the, the work of the great artist. We thank you that you are an infinite and eternal God and yet you are also one who has provided us with this world and reached out to us with salvation. We thank you today for the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that we read of in the scriptures every week, the one to whom you have pointed our attention and who has come to give to us in human form the understanding of God, God speaking to us in human. We thank you for him and we thank you for the glory and wonder and love of his salvation that he has uh, achieved for us at the cross by giving his life for us. How much does someone have to love you to sacrifice their life? And we thank you that uh, God himself has taken flesh and knowing everything that is known to know about us has yet given himself for us in every way. Lord, this morning as we are watching this video, so God willing, uh, much of the Helston Baptist Church is meeting to, to worship you physically and we thank you for that. We pray for that service there as those in that service will be praying for the folk watching this online this morning. And so, Lord, we ask that you would lift our hearts to you, that we would know assurance of forgiveness of sins, of a purpose in our life that comes from knowing you, of an identity that is solid and grounded in Christ. And, Lord, that we would be able to go out into this week knowing that that is our inheritance as we believe in Jesus. Thank you for him and thank you for this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we uh, were kind of answering the question, what were we doing a year ago? And uh, we showed some summer videos and, uh, well, a video of summer photographs. And you may remember it said to be continued at the end. So we're going to bring you part two now of the summer videos uh, from last week. And then we're going to have a song.
Well, I hope you enjoyed that video, and we also want to say thank you to Rachel for that song. And now I'm going to read to you the reading that we had last week uh, at the chapel, and then we're going to go over to the video of last week's talk. And the reading this morning is from Revelation chapter 1, and uh, we're going to read it from verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. 
When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Well, may God bless the reading of his word to us. And now here's the talk from last Sunday. Okay, so we're going to turn to God's word um, while the children are out. And uh, you might say, well, it's the first time uh, back together in a, in a sort of a substantial way, and we're looking at the book of Revelation. You know, isn't our life complicated enough without Alan pulling one of those sort of stunts? And uh, I just want to say, look, we're not doing any end time theories. There's no interpretation of events. There are no predictions. This morning, um, this is going to be uh, much simpler and much closer to home. I'm going to ask the question, and I know we've asked this before, uh, but I think this is an important time to ask it. Why are we here and what are we? What are we and why are we here? And we've been having a look at that and answering that question in one way on Tuesday evenings, but I want to answer it a different way this morning by using these verses in the book of Revelation to help us. Now, Revelation has the reputation of being extremely strange, and I'm not saying that it isn't in some ways, but we need to understand that what it's teaching us is not strange. What it's teaching us through very strange images are things that are essential to our faith, things that we need to know for the journey that we are on right now, uh, at this moment, and what you're facing this week, and what we will be facing as a church. It uses extraordinary imagery, but it does so to compel our attention and to engrave ideas into our minds that we carry them with us and that we will think them through. No, Revelation isn't exactly what you would call a normal book, but these aren't what you would call normal times either. And in many ways, Revelation is a book for this moment, I think. The new normal has not arrived. The new normal will not be here tomorrow morning when the legislation elapses. You can sort of see the new normal from here if you stand on tiptoe and look very, very hard. But I think that we need to look at the new normal through the lens that Revelation is so that we can see what we need to see going ahead. What do we need to see? What do these verses tell us amongst other things? It tells us that the church is both physical and spiritual. And usually, for Christians, it has been harder to keep the spiritual, transcendent uh, aspect of the church in mind, that heavenly vision of the church, because the physical is always smack right in our face, getting in the way. We tend to be very able to see, think about getting together and rotors and uh, jobs in the church and ministries and so forth. Those are just there in front of us all the time. And we have to work harder sometimes to remember that the church is something uh, glorious, heavenly and transcendent as well. Familiarity can breed ordinariness. We are, after all, very ordinary people in a very pretty, but in the end, you know, ordinary uh, building. Uh, we have very ordinary lives in many ways, but we mustn't let that sense of ordinariness be the dominant idea of who we are as a church, as a body of Christians. If we always saw the church as God does, we wouldn't. But if we always saw the church as God does, then there would never be a Sunday morning where it's a struggle to get up. There would never be a Sunday morning where you think it's raining, I wish I could stay at home. There'd never be a Sunday morning where you feel like turning over and staying in bed. Because that, would, that just would not happen if we could always see what God sees of a church which is both physical and spiritual. Physical tends to drown out the spiritual and the transcendent. And then 16 months ago, physical stopped instantly overnight. And we were forced to become, in some ways, a kind of non-physical church. We became more ethereal. We became a church that tended to exist in a cloud of digital colors floating across whatever screen that we were using. 
And months went by. We thought we were setting up online for a few weeks, maybe a couple of months. Caleb and I would predict how much longer this was going on on a regular basis after the broadcast, and we were generally completely wrong most of the way through, <laughs> and we never really got it right. It went on and on and on, and maybe bizarrely, it has got harder to imagine physical church. Have you got so used to digital that really grasping what it means to be in the same room together, talking to people, it, it is crowding around the, uh, the coffee bar at the post-16 and bumping into each other and getting coffee and biscuits and cakes and kids running around. Is that, does that seem like something that happened years ago now? The physicality of church has receded somewhat. Maybe church seemed more heavenly to you. After all, no more early mornings, no more driving, no more tech problems that, we had to, that you had to run around and work out, no more bumping into each other, no more issues arising because we were all at home at a disembodied church that appeared in our house. Now, possibly there's a good consequence from this. We've been forced to live with the truth that church is more than sitting together in rows, which we kind of knew, but it's very easy to slip into that, isn't it? Surely the first two or three weeks, the thing that hit us is we can still receive teaching, but you can't be together in the same way when you're online. And we tried everything that we could to keep that connectivity going. But suddenly it became very obvious that it was more than sitting together in rows, that we are an entity that transcends earthly limits. You can find it here in Revelation. You can find it in Hebrews. It's all over the place. The church is something incredible. But if that's all true, why are we here today? Why have we made the effort to come back? Why were there people in this chapel during the week cleaning? We won't tell you what they were cleaning uh, and sorting things out and connecting wires and putting a hazard tape all over the place. Why, why did we go to that incredible effort to do this? Well, let's draw a parallel with human nature. History and the history of the church swings in the way it views what's important about being a human being. For many periods of history, it's seen that the spiritual is paramount and people have been taught that the body, the physical life, that's just a kind of an interruption. It's a shell. It's something you're trying to escape away from. That's wrong. And then the pendulum swings the other way to where we were probably about 15 years ago, which is no, it's about being on earth. It's all about physical. And if you keep thinking about spiritual and heavenly things, you become of no earthly use. History tends to swing to extremes. Well, what is the truth? The truth is that humanity is both physical and spiritual, and ultimately always will be. That is what we are. We are both things. And the church is also physical and spiritual. It is who we are. So, if a sense over the last 16 months has grown upon us, a sense that we are more than merely physical, if we are transcendent, if we are a spiritual reality that God has created, as we make re-entry into planet Earth, as we blaze through the atmosphere into normal life, as they're calling it, can we take that sense with us? Can we take that sense that we are more than people sitting in rows, that we are more than a building, that we are more than the ordinariness that we see because God has made us much, much more? Can we take that with us? Can we be intentional as physical life just gets back in our face again, in, in every area of life, can we be intentional to keep that vision of the transcendent, glorious church of God with us as well? Will that be important? Well, the book of Revelation was written to churches and to a church that was or was about to be absolutely hammered by persecution and hideous things were going to befall churches and were already befalling them, as you read through the little letters at the beginning. These terrible things were going to come crashing down upon them. And it is clearly God's intent that the things that he writes in the book of Revelation would, in some sense, help them to endure through the tribulations that were coming. Now, we might not be facing anything as bad as that. We just don't know at the moment as, the, as time goes by. But we are facing a world that has changed. Some changes have accelerated. Changes that we saw coming and we thought would be maybe another 10 years. Social, cultural, um, even ecclesial changes that we were concerned about have accelerated through lockdown. 
Uh, one news article said that we went to sleep in 2020 and we woke up in 2030 in terms of some of those changes. They've gone so fast. Some of those might be good. Some of them may be bad. And as we try to be the church in the new normal, it may be that the book of Revelation is exactly what we need. It may be the sustaining vision that we need for the days ahead. So verses 12 through to 20 give us a vision of Jesus and a vision of the church. John sees Jesus. He turns around and the Jesus that he's always known is there. But he also sees Jesus and describes Jesus to us uh, in a patchwork. In fact, his whole vision is a patchwork of images carefully, carefully woven together, images and objects that he sees in this vision. It's helpful to remember that the main source book for the book of Revelation is the Old Testament. Most of the imagery that you see throughout the book of Revelation you can find is already there in most of the Old Testament and one or two New Testament ideas as well. Um, as we come to look at these images, think about it this way. Imagine, imagine a bowling alley and uh, somebody along that bowling alley has sprinkled iron filings in patches. And when they give you a bowling ball, it's, um, it's a shiny magnetic sphere. And if you, if you rolled that ball down the length of the alley, by the time it reached the end, it would have picked up patches of iron filings. It would be fuzzy in places and covered in different patches of filings. So imagine the whole of the Bible is one scroll, one enormously long scroll that has been rolled out in front of you. And God takes an idea, and it's a magnetic, shiny idea, and he rolls that idea the length of the Bible, so by the time it reaches Revelation, that idea is now covered in images and ideas that it's picked up from the Old Testament. So if you're fearful about the book of Revelation, bear in mind that these are not mostly ideas that we haven't come across before. They are now, they've picked up, they've accrued uh, all of these Old Testament images and some New Testament imagery as well, so that when John sees these things, He's telling us through the patchwork of Old Testament ideas. And that's really, really helpful for understanding what's going on. So John turns around and he sees Jesus. Jesus is called one like to a son of man. Well, that's the name in Daniel 7 given to a remarkable figure who is both heavenly and human. And it's also Jesus' favorite title for himself in the gospel. So we know that this is Jesus, the heavenly and human Jesus. He's wearing a robe with a golden sash, which is primarily high priestly, but also kingly. He has very, very white hair, which in addition to being a very cool contemporary look, is also here reminiscent of the ancient of days that we find uh, in the same passage in the book of Daniel. He has blazing eyes, like the blazing eyes of like torches in Daniel 10. He has a voice that it's like many, like we would think of standing next to Niagara Falls. His, his voice is as mighty and dominating as that, straight out of Ezekiel. He has a word, a sword that comes out of his mouth, which is a bizarre image, but it's just that he's speaking the word of God. He shines like the sun. Habakkuk says God shines like the sun. We can think of the transfiguration. He is the first and the last. He was before time. He will be there at the end of history, unchanged. He is crucified and risen. He has the keys of death and hell. So his complete and finished salvation is sufficient to lock the doors of hell and death against you and against me, despite our doubts and fears that we might get there. He has the keys. You do not. It is in the grace of Christ that we are saved and we are saved and in his hands and no one can pluck us out. So we have, we have all of these images and as they hit John, his system crashes and he collapses before this, this figure. Bearing in mind, John was his nearest friend. John knew him well and it just overwhelms him and he's down. But it is a, a glorious and longed for overwhelming. It is an overwhelming that is splendid in every way. The outshining of the second person of the Trinity. So John is, is describing to us this multifaceted, glorious image of the Lord Jesus Christ in so many different ways, beyond all imagining. And where is he? He's in the midst of the lampstands, which is the church. This person who is all these things, verse 13 tells us, is in the midst of the lampstands. And in verse 20 it says the lampstands are 
the seven churches. Where has Jesus been for the last 16 months? He has been in the midst of the churches. Covid and lockdown and everything that's happened hasn't stopped that. He has been in the midst of the churches. Where is he today? He is here in the midst of his church and in all the other churches, all the Bible-believing, gospel-preaching churches. Jesus is there. It, It just hasn't changed. All his focus and attention is still where it always was, upon his people. He is the son of man. He is the kingly high priest. He is the first and the last. He is risen from the dead. He does have the keys of of death and hell. And where is his focus of attention? During all of that, it is upon his church. It is all for and with his people. We were not forgotten in lockdown and we are not lost in a crowd today. None of this has changed because of this global upheaval much has changed. This has not changed. Why are we lampstands? Well, God takes the, the idea of the church and he rolls it along the scroll of the Bible and it picks up images along the way. The church is a lampstand, which takes this and makes us think of the lampstand in the tabernacle with the seven branches representing the, the, the outshining of the presence of God. It, goes through Zechariah's lampstand in Zechariah 4 the the lampstand with seven cups for the lamps that's fueled by two olive trees with pure and unceasing oil Uh, this is the power and the presence of the spirit of God flowing through the church so the lampstand says to us the church should be the outshining of the presence of God empowered by the Holy Spirit and we we saw at the end of uh, the Beatitudes, um, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, that you, you are a lamp that is not covered. You are a city on a hill, outshining the presence of God. How will we be church in the new normal? Well, right after the vision of the lampstand that Zechariah has, Zechariah says this in chapter 4, 6 and 7, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. We have lots to do. We have lots to figure out once the summer's over. We have lots of things to to get on with. And we will need creativity and patience and endurance. We'll need to bear with one another. That whole relational atrophy, we've just not been able to get together. We've got to learn how to, to be together in some ways again, as we will do in other areas of life. We need to do all those things. But we need two things above all. We need an overwhelming vision of God in Christ. We need to be overwhelmed by him. If we are going to be the church that we need to be, we need to see Jesus clearly. And we need to know what we are and who we are and why we're here. We are the church that is to be empowered by the Spirit of God. When I was thinking about uh, this week when I was doing this, writing this, and thought about the lampstand in Zechariah, I remembered that I'd preached on that passage some years ago and I looked it up just to see what I'd said and I said this uh, we have been led to think that success for churches requires mega churches and celebrity pastors if we are to have impact but growth comes from ordinary people empowered by the spirit here we are ordinary people sat in a disused chapel all spread out with face masks on and still limited and yet this truth shines through so much the more the age of the mega church is now predicted to be coming to an end the cult of the celebrity pastor is crumbling to ashes as we speak this morning it's over if we ever needed to know something we need to know this now that ordinary physical people ordinary spiritual people empowered by the Holy Spirit, having their systems crashed by the majesty of God is going to be how to be church in whatever world is opening up to us over the next few months. We all remember just over a year ago the predictions that when people's lives were shook to the core, they were saying, when we come out of this, we are not going to be the same people. We're going to make life different. Life in Britain will be different. We're going to have a different set of values. We are going to be less like we were and more like this. The materialism will go. The arguing will go. The, and obviously as Christians, 
any Christian would experience an idea of total depravity and a grasp of a minimum of history thinks, mm, maybe. And here we are a year later. What are we dealing with? Racism, factions, rows, poor nations with less than 1% vaccines and we're not doing all that much about it. You know, all the things that we said a year ago as a culture, some of it may have changed. But a lot of it looks very similar, that we're dealing with the same problems we always were, and we're probably not surprised about that. People are trying. People across our nation are trying. In common grace, people are working hard to try and solve these problems, but they always are limited. We can be very grateful for them, but we know that they're going to be limited. But the church has incredible resources. We have amazing resources. We have a gospel that both humbles us and fills us with hope. We are a church with incredible resources. We are physical and spiritual, touchable but transcendent. Will we be enough? Well, you know what a faithful, loving church is? It's a lampstand. That's all we can be. All we can be is a lampstand. We didn't make the lamp. We don't supply the fuel. We don't create the light. We're a vessel. And that's all we have to be. Be thou my vision of a world of my heart Lord, be all else to me Say that thou That my best thought in the day of a night Waking us sleeping Thy presence my life Be thou my wisdom Be thou my true word I ever with thee And thou with me
Well, I hope you've enjoyed our time together. What I'm going to do now is pray for you. And then, uh, don't turn off yet, there's a little bit of information about what's happening next week, which is a little bit unusual. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we pray that it would dwell richly in our hearts. And we also commit everybody watching today uh, into your care and ask that you would be with them through this week. Maybe it's been a really good week so far and much to look forward to. Maybe it's been challenging, maybe it's sad and there's difficult things ahead. We just wanna pray for everybody, Lord, that they would know that you are always listening and that our help comes from you. So Lord, please walk with each person uh, in their lives through the days ahead and may they find in you much strength and comfort and assurance. In Jesus' name, Amen. So next week will be a little bit different, and I know we've only just started these um, uh, these new style broadcasts as it is, but uh, next week the physical church will actually be closed just for this one Sunday, and uh, in part that's because there is a big Christian event taking place in Cornwall called Creation Fest, and there are quite a few folk from our church who will still be going along to that this year, uh, as they often do. Uh, but also that event is going to be streamed online and so for next week not only will there not be a physical service we won't have this specific Halston Baptist Church broadcast either so what we're going to do instead is we will where it normally says on Facebook or wherever click this and uh, you can go to our YouTube channel next week what's going to be on Facebook and in any emails you receive will be a link saying click this on Sunday morning and you can watch Creation Fest live from the Royal Cornwall Showground. So that's what's going to happen next week for physical church and for online church. Uh, what we're encouraging everybody to do is to tune in to the live stream from Creation Fest. Creation Fest isn't quite as big this year. It's all going to have to be done differently and socially distanced. It's not quite the epically large event that it often is, uh, but it's still a um, fairly significant event. And uh, they often have really, really good material to, to watch and join in with. So please, would really encourage you, tune into Creation Fest next week. And then on Sunday, the 8th of August, we will be back here with this new style broadcast for you. Now, if you need to know anything, or there's anything you want to mention, or even send in, you can still send stuff in and it will appear, uh, not live, but in a, in a future broadcast, then please just get in touch the usual way, church email address, WhatsApp, uh, or the Facebook message. Uh, all of that will still get through to us. It just won't be happening live on a Sunday morning. Hope that's all clear. More information will be in our media channels as usual, and we will see you next time. God bless and take care.